Welcome to the Living the Dream Podcast with Curveball. If you believe, you can achieve. Welcome to the Living the Dream with Curveball Podcast, a show where I interview guests that teach, motivate, and inspire. Today, I am joined by author and decorated combat veteran, Jason Pike. Jason served 31 years in the United States Army, enlisted and as an officer. He is a lieutenant colonel. He served overseas for nine years in five countries, has over 30 service awards. So we're going to be talking to him about his story. And he just informed me in the, in the green room that his book just became a number one bestseller. So we're going to be talking about that as well. So Jason, thank you so much for joining me today. Hey, Curtis. Hey, thank you very much. I'm honored to be on your show. And uh, yeah, let's get it going. Absolutely. We're definitely honored to have you. Why don't you start off by telling everybody a little bit about yourself? Well, my name is Jason Pike. I, like you said, I served 31 years in the military. Nine years were overseas. Just like any life, uh, I'm, a, I'm an author, I'm a combat veteran, I'm a speaker, but like every life, we have our ups and downs. And uh, I got through just a few months ago uh, writing uh, a, a book called A Soldier Against All Odds. And A Soldier Against All Odds, it just hit number one last week. I'm really excited about that. And yes, uh, many, many crazy, wild stories. I feel that this book is set up a little differently than a lot of military books because, yeah, I've seen blood and guts, but this book is about life lived with the ups and downs and the pitfalls of a life in uniform. Okay, well, well why don't you start off just by telling everybody what, what made you decide to get into the military in the first place? It seems like that was going to be the only option for success with me. Um, I, I young as a young boy, I was identified as a, a challenged or a disabled learner, meaning I just don't get things very well compared to the mass population. So I was uh, in uh, I was living uh, with my family in uh, outside of Atlanta, Georgia, and I failed my first grade year. Uh, and they sent me to take a test and they identified that I had some problems just reading and writing. Yeah. Oh, by the way, I'm an author, but okay, well, that's another story. But no, and so I thought, well, you know, pretty much college was not going to be an option is what we thought. So I thought, well, I'll join the South Carolina National Guard at the age of 17, which is what I did. And it pretty much went on from there. So at the age of seven and nine, you, you were diagnosed with a, with a couple of uh, a learning disability, first of all, and a, and a disease. So, so when did you kind of realize that, you, you know, life was going to go a little bit different than say your friends and family and, and talk about your learning disability and any other disease that you were diagnosed with? Yes. So osteomyelitis was what I was diagnosed with as far as the physical ailment on my left knee. My knee uh, basically dissolved twice. It was very painful. So that was age nine. Now at age seven, the diagnosis of a learning disability was there. So physically and probably intellectually, there was not a whole lot of expectations. I'm not going to be joining a sports team or anything like that. So, but even though I did love football, so failure and pain came to me early as a kid. And I think kids are pretty resilient and that, that sort of just set me up to be a little bit more stronger uh, than I think a lot of other people. This world, we like to talk about resist, uh, resiliency and persistence. So my story is, is one of survival, persistent, and never giving up, uh, whether it be physical or even intellectual. Now, in the end, I've got three college degrees. I got two masters. I got one bachelor's. So I worked through things. I have a chapter in my book, even while I was in the, you know, when I was going through the military, 
Uh, learn to be creative and work differently. And there's an entire chapter just for kids or people that want to help their uh, family. Where there is a wheel, there's an A. And I have various techniques uh, that I use to sitting in front of the class, uh, note-taking cards or recordings and all that type of things. There's all kind of little techniques I used. This memoir is spoken into a very basic, easy to read form. Like I had, <laughs> I had, so uh, even, so I wanted it at a level where you could understand it as a storytelling type of story. It's a very true memoir. And that's kind of where it was coming from age seven and nine. And then of course, um, I joined the South Carolina National Guard. Some people question, they wonder how in the world did I join a national organization or, you know, a state, a state organization without having a cop. I didn't have a high school diploma when I joined. I eventually got it. But I at that time in the South Carolina, in the Guard, you didn't need a high school diploma, believe it or not. And also the physical problem. I sort of got around that at the gym. So in the gym, I would do my leg lifts and I would do various building muscles that were around the knee to help minimize that issue. I never told, <laughs> I never, I never told the guard, actually, they said, are you okay physically? And I said, and I lied and I said, yeah, I'm okay. No problems. And this was before the internet. Another, another, so I got around it that way. <laughs> I kind of joined at loose ends, but I was happy just to join. Um, you have to take an entrance test to the military for the most part. Uh, I did. That's a, a mystery remains to me is how I passed that entrance test. I really don't under, that's a mystery. I wish I, <laughs> they may have just said, hey, he's good. <laughs> he said, hey, he's good. Bring him on in or something. But because I know that my standardized scores with in college entrance tests are very, very low. I would, I, would, I would guess that they're lower than most of your viewers out there. But uh, that's just me thinking. So that's kind of how it kind of started on early on there. Yeah. Well, let's talk about in your 31 years of service. Let's talk about a good, a very bad and ugly situation that you can think of in your years of service? Mm, a very good or a very exciting experience, which I enjoyed very much, was jumping out of airplanes, jump, jumping out of perfectly, perfectly good airplanes. <laughs> and so I was a, for a while, I was an airborne trooper. I got my airborne patch down at uh, Fort uh, Benning, Georgia. And I just enjoyed it. I enjoyed it really well. And I was eventually assigned to be a support person in the 10th Special Forces group. It was a, a Green Beret outfit. I was not a Green Beret. I was a support guy. And we jumped out of airplanes and did all kind of nice, exciting things. And whew, I remember one time jumping out at night and I was the first one out the door and it was scary. That was kind of scary. But you just pay attention to your training and do what you got to do um, and you just, you know, that's then just land, but combat, the landing fall is the most uh, dangerous part because you don't want to break anything. So that was a very, a very exciting time in my life. And uh, I'm an airborne trooper. And I thought, wow, this is pretty cool. So yeah, that would be the most enjoyable. And well, go let's ahead. talk about a bad and an ugly situation. Oh gosh, there are many bad and ugly. <laughs> I could go into a lot of bad and ugly, so I'm gonna have to pick one out, which is kind of difficult to talk about. I've been I've been talking about it a little bit here, but um, so we all we all have our bad 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 experiences in life, and this experience I'm about to tell you had to do when I was a senior uh, lieutenant colonel. I was a uh, a lieutenant colonel is a, actually a senior manager in the organization of the U.S. Army. And mm, it was located uh, in South Korea. Uh, no problem with South Korea. I'm OK. I've been there twice. This was my third time. And uh, so that's where a lot of people get stationed in the military, just like a lot of places around the world. So I was there. I, I didn't get along with we've all been we've all heard that term possibly being thrown under the bus or, you know, being ghost lighted. And, you know, that's stressful. Um, big organizations or schools or churches or anyone, they can sort of stir up rumors and try to make your life miserable. 
And I already at that point had been a senior officer in the military with a whole lot of rec recognition and awards. But I just, you know, I, I stepped on a few toes, maybe said the wrong things and basically professionally on a professional basis about things. And I was thrown under the bus. I went through a pretty arduous federal investigation. I was, um, again, uh, we go back to inspiration, survival and persistence. And I was thrown under the bus and I had to go through. Um, I was brought in to my commander's office. I had to face the Central Intelligence, uh, the uh, Criminal Investigation Division and MI, Military Intelligence they were briefing me of the situation that I was going to be facing, which was allegations uh, that I was passing on secrets and information to foreign nationals, which was total bogus, total not true. And it very much surprised me. I, I kind of knew who was behind it, but, you know, I kind of got mad at the messengers. They were just giving us the message and doing their job. So what happens is a lot of time and, you know, organizations, we have these hotlines, they're anonymous types of channels where you can send out information to people that you think might be doing something bad, maybe, could be. With me, it was subversion and espionage against the U.S. government. There are other hotlines out there, suicide hotlines, there are sexual assault hotlines, you got hotlines for many, many things. And so I didn't know it at the time that someone had, you know, alerted the, the CID and the MI that, that I'm, and so I was briefed on what was going on. I had two different sets. One, I had one set of CID in my commander's office. I had another set of CID in my office. We were right, ne we were right next to each other. MI, military uh, uh, intelligence was in both offices. These were civilian clothed uniforms. And they told me about what I was going to be facing. And I got very, I got very angry at them because I knew that I didn't do anything and they pissed me off and I had to, they said, do you want to go see a defense attorney of the military? And I said, hell yeah, I want to go see a defense attorney. This shit pisses me off. Now, I don't know. I, I think I know who's behind it. And I was mad because I don't know why they have to do that. If they've got all this technology and they can understand certain things that probably I cannot do uh, or, or see behind the computer or everything else. So, uh, yeah, I went and, I went to go see the C. I, uh, I went to go see my defense attorney uh, that was in South Korea, army military guy, and he told me he says what's going to be happening and what's going to happen while you're here is they're going to be following you around, having crazy phone calls, trying to set you up and do stuff. That's he says that's considered their job because they've already got information. They feel they have information, so they want to find out more. So they're going to be checking you out more, and they did. They boom cameras, uh, crazy phone calls. Weird stuff ha happening, computer crashes, and weird. In that chapter, I'm just telling you one of the one of one of the stories in a, in just one chapter. There was other things that occurred during that two to three year stint that I had there in South Korea, and it really brought a lot of anxiety to me and my family. And there was false, false information, false allegations can cause uh, problems in people and rumors and in the window get spread. And therefore your name is mud. It was name is my name was mud at the time. And I had to find a way to get that through. It was really, really difficult. Once I was leaving another thing about it is let's just say, like, okay, well, what, what a lot of people ask, well, what did you do? I just professionally, I think I pissed some people off uh, about my job and what I need to do with my job. That's, that's what happened. But then they go or other people, senior other people want to throw stuff out there. that are allegations that made my life miserable. So I paid the price for that. I paid the price. There's no doubt, no doubt about that. And so what I did was I left Korea, left South Korea. That was part I, just, I did my tour there, my three years to tour. And then my dad was diagnosed to die. At that point, and for years, I could not just tell you what I just told you about the investigation. I could that was in my mind. I couldn't really explain it. It was it was just festering, and uh, it was like something. And so my dad started to die. I went back to the United States while he was dying. Oh, by the way, you're going to war. You're going to go into our war zone. So I was in pretty much hell at that time, mentally hell. I could, if I wanted to. 
I was in such hell, I could have gotten out of going to war because mental health, my, 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 my concentration was, it already been, you know, memory and concentration and, and being able to um, do things are always difficult. They've always been difficult and I've struggled with it, but at this point and stress can do that as well. So, but I, I had to pick myself up and go on to, to Afghanistan. But uh, that was like the big, big time. And it took me a little while to get over that and try to work through that. Sometimes time, time has a way to heal, but you just can't, it's not just time. You got to work on things. And so it took me a while for that. Yeah. Well, let's talk about, uh, l- l- let's segue into the next question is, uh, what was the main thing that you did to, deal with all the stress and trauma because not only did you have the federal investigation, you know, but you were, you went to combat. So, so what did you do to deal with all that stress and trauma during your years in the military? You got to have your family, the close family and fem- members, your wife, your daughter, or well, the daughter, <laughs> she's no way she could understand it anyway, but your whoever your spouse is, your partner or your, your loyal friends, you got to talk to them. That's what you so if you can't talk to them, you talk to a counselor. That was the first time I ever went to a counselor. I was kind of embarrassed about it because I was a senior. I'm a combat veteran. I'm a strong dude and mentally and, you know, at that time physically as well. And I am, but I just was embarrassed about that. I had to go and find help. I did that. I worked out at the gym and I processed a lot of the photographs that we all have photographs and reminds of memories and things. But what I did just, just by accident is I got on an elliptical machine that it does a left, right, left technique through exercise. And I started to uh, cry on the machine. I started to laugh on the machine and vom- you know, kind of, it's like a vomiting effect. It's just getting things out. And it took a few, three, four, five weeks. And I would continue to do it just as daily therapy for the, a lot. And it's not just working. Well, working out is good, but if you can go into a zone where there's photographs that you have in your mind can uh, be uh, exuded or exuded out and uh, whatever emotion you have, it doesn't matter who's around it. It doesn't matter. Don't worry about who's looking at you. <laughs> they probably looked at me and thought I was crazy as hell, but you just do it anyway. That's part of your exercise, part of your mental therapy. It's physical and mental. And I did that a good bit. Now, when I went, when I went into combat, into Afghanistan, really, I I was feeling I wasn't I'd been trained for a war for all these years and, and, and do it. We trained even extra for for Afghanistan before we go there. So we kind of know what to do. I kind of have a lot of the training already there and there even. But but it was just that mental. It was that one two punch. So the one punch was that federal investigation. The number two punch is your father's death. They occurred and you're not, you maybe you're not processing it the best way you can. And so then I go to Afghanistan. I'm already in a weakened, I'm in a weakened type of a mindset. And that's the hardest part is when I went to war, just like everyone else, there were, you know, I eat improvised explosive devices. There was incoming rounds, mortars and things of that nature. But we, to me, I don't know. When I was in Afghanistan, I kind of had a death. I had a death wish in a way. Let's just go ahead and just take me out so I can go see my father. And so I wasn't a lot of people asked me, were you, were you scared in war? For, for the most part, I was not, which is not normal. <laughs> That's not normal. It's good to have fear, a little bit of fear. But I was just in that mental state to where I'm thinking, yeah, come, come kill me. I'll just I'll go, I'll go to heaven and go see my father. That's all. I just don't want to be maimed. Please, God, just don't maim me. <laughs> just, just take me out. But um, uh, that's kind of my mental state. My mental state also was just trying to keep up with, you know, just basic things. I had other soldiers to help take care of me. They had known that my father had recently passed away. And so they sort of took extra, extra care special. Uh, they took a lot of time to help me out, <laughs> which I needed. And, um, and it was really just, just doing the daily, daily, daily tasks and, and, and just taking care of me and doing a little bit more extra, you know, leadership and things to help me out. Um, so Afghanistan was sort of just a minor aggravation. It was kind of like a number three punch because just like you said, I was going to go leave my wife and child and those were so good support. They were good support mechanisms and I'm leaving them. And uh, now I've got to figure out how to do this through exercise and through time and through effort and things of that nature. 
So really, we did, it was kind of, this was another strange thing. I just thought about it. I did very, very, I probably did the best performance in a way in Afghanistan that I've ever done before. I just, it was like one of those things you get shot down and then you just say, okay, I'm going to try again. I'm going to get up and I'm going to focus and just do this and get through this. And um, the soldiers, we had trained months before we deployed to Afghanistan, extra training. They knew what to do. And basically when we went there, I just said, you know, put my left foot in front of the right foot and just take care of my soldiers and try to take care of me. And we did really, really well overall in Afghanistan. Well, speaking of your father, you know, you, you had you talk in the book about how you had a fight with your father. Tell us about that and, and as well as <laughs> how important your father is in your life. Oh, oh. yeah. He, <laughs> yeah, we I was very, very I was very close to my father. I actually became more more closer to him after the federal investigation because he was one of the people I leaned on and talked to. And um and so we actually got a lot closer before his death. I mean, and so I had a lot of conversations with him and uh so that was really that was a sweet part of a bad thing i guess because so how we got close together and we could talk really freely and openly to each other like we never had so he means a lot to me everybody know love him a lot <laughs> and this book is dedicated to him now we're talking about the fight <laughs> so the fight we had um so my, my my dad was sort of a rough and tumble guy he grew up uh you know in pretty much dire poverty. I did not. I was never hungry. I always had food, but he, he grew up very, very poor, but he always just, you know, he played around sometimes and that's cool. But I come back from when I went to my first entry level uh, training uh, in, in, in Fort Seal, Oklahoma, I was 17 years old. I come back when I was 18 it was basic training. That's the basic army, basic training. Uh, I went to, boot, uh, some people call it the old boot camp, boot camp. I come back and he he detected a little bit of rough and tough and kind of a, you know, attitude and a little bit confidence. And he wanted to test me out. So he started, you know, pushing me around. And uh, and eventually he threw me on the floor and he pinned me. And uh, when he I eventually I, I, I was able to I was able to turn around, flip around. I actually picked him up and I body slammed him and then I pinned him down. And I got on him. Once I body slammed my dad, my father, my father, which he said, no more, no more. I'm done. And that was it. And I, I thought, oh, God, I think I may have broke his back or something uh, because he, he pushed me around and I flipped him. And I threw him down. I don't I wish I could talk to him. I wish I wish I could talk to him about that story a little bit more. But um, but that's that's what happened. He says, hey, you're good. You're cool. And that was there was no more fights after that one. Yeah. Okay, well, yeah, I, I guess you proved to him what you needed to prove. Yeah, he, you know, sometimes when I look at that fight, I wonder if he was allowing me to put him down or sometimes, or did I really take him down? Because he was, <laughs> you don't want to mess my father. You don't want to mess my father. He's, he's, he was a fighter. Uh, he was a fighter. And uh, so I sometimes think that he was just trying to maybe sometimes uh, I feel that he just wanted to build up more confidence, more confidence in me than I already had. Because, uh, of course, I had less. I didn't have as much confidence as a lot of kids. And uh, but he said, well, I'm going to test him, maybe giving more. I don't know. And also, I think sometimes maybe I really did hurt him a little bit because he didn't. He didn't. Yeah, I don't know. He, he, he's fought a lot. And I, and I think, well, you know, he's he's had more fights. He's had more fights than I have. And so I don't know. I don't know if I ever, I don't know if I really did, you know, beat his butt, but it's, it's, it's just a good memory. And, um, and just like you're talking right now is I had to go through all this stuff of putting just stuff out there and then having someone help to put this thing into a book. And it's a really, it's a, it's been a, it's been one, uh, this book has been one hell of an experience. There's, there's no doubt about that. Well, let's talk about your, your main source of inspiration, but because your story is definitely amazing and you definitely had to have some inspiration along the way. What is your main source of inspiration? Well, we all have those times. I think the insp once the, the big inspiration and the very big change in me is what I kind of sort of described when, when I came back from basic training. So in basic training, I was 17. I was considered one of the worst 
private soldiers. And they sent me and one other person to either make or break. I assumed that I was going to be kicked out of the military. And uh, I just couldn't get my things together. I, it could be my helmet's on wrong, my equipment's on wrong. Always constantly screaming and yelling and trying to pr- improve me. And uh, it was just, you know, when you go to basic training and you're learning, they're, they've got to they gotta break you down to build you back up. That's what they do. They get, you get a civilian, you break them down, you rail them up. Uh, and I wouldn't. I wasn't, you know, adapting that well. It was, it was really difficult to drink the water coming out of the damn fire hose. It was coming out so fast. Do this, do that. Show up here. Have this equipment. Do, 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 do. And that. So I. They said, okay, well, oh, Jason, he's not getting this thing. And this other another guy. He ain't getting it either. We're going to send the worst over there to. They sent us to a criminal correctional facility at Fort Sill, Oklahoma. CCF. It's a it's it's a place for criminals, but we didn't we didn't do anything criminally. It was sort of a drug deal in the world of some of the army leaders to where we can try to make them or break them. Or I don't know, I guess it, it could be like that old scared straight program. And once I entered that facility and it was only for a half of a day, it it was a different level of hell than I had before. So the, the streaming, the yelling, uh, the exercises, making big rocks into small rocks with a pick, the obstacle courses. It was escalated at an extreme level to where, you know, phys- physical body and injury occurred, of which both of us occurred to or anybody who was going through that. And, you know, climbing over hot rocks and just tearing uniforms up, getting bloodied and bruised and your uniforms. That's, that's the type of level that it went to. Well, I assumed at that time that I was going to be kicked out of the military because I just didn't get what the drill sergeant was telling me. I didn't do what I was supposed to do, and I assumed it was over. But what they did is they just said, okay, you're all going back. Go back. Well, two of us. We went back to the platoon, all bloodied and broken up, and we were used basically as a as guinea pigs or examples to set that Okay, we come back, we're all bloodied and bruised and just been through hell. So the drill sergeant says, hey, you other guys, look at these. Go and talk to these two sorry ass privates. If you don't do what I say, you're going there too. And they went and looked at us and we were just standing there like a bunch of sorry beat up privates, and that's which we were. At that point, there was something that sort of snapped in me a little bit. And um, it was... And I, I, did, I just, I didn't break me up. The other guy broke. It was just too much. I, uh, I decided I was going to stay in and do the best. Even, you know, maybe I have to work harder and, and maybe do things or, or whatever. And so I did. And there, a lot of people saw a change in me. And, oh, and again, just like I said, with that fight, <laughs> coming back and they could, they could detect a different level of uh, personality that I had. And um, that's, Whew, that's a that was a that's a hell of a story. <laughs> that's a, yes, but it's criminal. I went to the criminal conf- uh, confinement facility there at Fort Sill, Oklahoma. Absolutely. So tell the listeners about one one takeaway you want everybody to to, to take away from your book or, or your main goal for writing your book. The takeaway is oh, this is an inspirational book. This is a hope survival, and no matter what phase of life you're in. We all get down, and I've had <laughs> I've had my share of ups and downs, but I, I come to you in a way that would be an easy read. I, I am the R, I am the narrator and the author. It's also an audio book, so you're getting it from a horse's mouth, which I think is a little different. So um, you can look at it that way, um, and not even have to actually read the book. You can listen to the book. So I just want to, uh, any, if I can help anybody <laughs> in life, uh, it could anything. Uh, it could be military or not, or not military. That's going to make a whole lot. That's going to help me out a whole lot. It's going to, you know, that's that's my that's my goal is to do that. And um, right now, um, I'm I'm practicing on my expression, uh, podcasting. Now you're listening to somebody right now that I was not that way a year ago. In other words, so I ha- I'm, I'm right now I'm age 57. So, but last year I was learning about how to express myself in this audiobook. So I've learned a skill even the, that I have been working on and practicing on to get the message out there. And so I understand that you've got a skill, these podcasters got skill and I'm working on that to, you know, make it better and better and better. 
So that's my, um, it just made number one as far as number one uh, bestseller last week. And I'm proud about that, um, which, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that's, that's kind of what I'm doing right now. Okay. Well, to tell the listeners about some upcoming projects that, that you're working on that we all need to be aware of. So I'm, I'm continuing right now with podcasts. So this book will be continued podcasts. I, since I went to a number one level that might bring me into a different level. I don't know. I'm just of, of podcasting or promotion. So I'm going to run with that. I would like to do a TED talk or an inspirational, uh, motivational public speaking project. As far as a, you know, something, it could be a video. It could be in real in, in person or something. So I'm looking on that. There's a, I've, I have played around with the ideas of another book. I haven't put pen to paper on it or hired anybody to help me out, but I'm, I'm looking at that. But I guess in the meantime, the viewers can just look at the po- podcast or just look at the audio and give me a thumbs up, a review. Um, I really like in reviews. We all like reviews. And so um, that's kind of what I'm doing. Yeah. Okay. Tell them, tell them your website so uh, everybody okay. can keep up with everything that you're up to. Jasonpike.org. Uh, Jason pike.org um the book is in the browser jason pike jason pike in your amazon account you'll see the book there you're going to see it on audio audible jason pike um you just type it in there you're going to see the blue book it's not going to be difficult to find you'll see the description and things of that nature and a soldier a soldier against all odds a soldier against all odds just type that in your browser you'll find me i'm on facebook and a lot of other places but that's the main place all right, close us out with some final thoughts, maybe something that I forgot to talk about that you would like to talk about or just any final thoughts that you have for the listeners. Well, really, a lot of life, uh, as you know, is showing up at the right time and the right equipment with the right attitude. Right time, right equipment, right attitude. And you might be doing probably better than 50, more 60, 70% of everybody else just go there with the right time, the right attitude. And I think that uh, inspiration, hope, survival, that's kind of where you go. I've, I have a, got a lot of, <laughs> I can burn time with stories, but you just tell me when, Curtis, and I'm, I'm good. Oh, no, I think we, we, we got it good, ladies and gentlemen, jasonpike.org. Please check out his book, you, you know, uh, give him a review. And Jason, uh, once again, thank you for your service. Everybody, please follow, rate, review, share this episode to as many people as possible. If you have any guests or suggestion topics, see Jackson102 at Cox.net is the place to send them. Thank you for listening. And Jason, thank you so much for joining us today. I was honored to be on your show. For more information on the Living the Dream podcast, visit www.djcurveball.com. Until next time, stay focused on living the dream.